Good morning. Good morning and welcome here on this Labor Day weekend Sunday. Beautiful day, beautiful people, beautiful place to be, and a beautiful reason to celebrate. Our God is good and our God is here. Amen? Amen. Our God has blessed us with a lot of things, and this Sunday, the next two Sundays, we want to focus on, on stewardship. What does it mean to live as a people who have been given and been blessed by God so much as we. And so to begin, I'm going to invite you to help me proclaim the words of Psalm 24 with just a little bit of commentary put into it, but it gets to the point. So in the inserts in your bulletin, it's not going to be projected up there, in the inserts in the bulletin, you're going to help me start off our worship service this morning by, first of all, pulling out those inserts, second of all, standing up, And then third of all, helping me read this together. Together. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. The world and all those who live in it. Really? Why is it the Lord's? Let's be honest. Seriously? Does this really include me? Does this include all of us? Okay, so God owns you, God owns me, but that doesn't mean that God owns all of my things. Even my money? Yes, even all your money. Even my time? Even my energy? Yes, even all your energy. All right, I guess God does own all things in my life. I suppose that should make a difference in how I live my life. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and all those who live in it. For God has founded it upon the seas and established it on the rivers. Let's give thanks, number 50, in our, in our hymn books. Praise the Lord, sing hallelujah.
I invite you to invite your neighbor and someone you haven't met yet this morning to this place. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this energy. I thank you for these people. I thank you for the reason that we're gathered here. I pray now that your spirit flow through this place with your power and your wisdom and your insight, that no one leaves this place untouched by your wisdom and by your healing and your peace. Lord, join us in this place and inspire us to our fullest. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Prince of Peace, our Savior and our Lord. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. As a continued prayer, as a continued reflection on all that God has given us, let's sing for the beauty of the earth. Verses 1, 4, and 5. One of those gifts is our children, and I invite them all forward as Dave has a message for us and for you, kids. So come on down. Good morning. How are you guys today? Good. Well, today, 
Pastor Wilmer's going to give us part of the message today, a little talk about stewardship. And I got to thinking while I was getting ready for this, trying to figure out a way to try to explain a little bit of stewardship to you. And I thought I'd try at least a little bit. God is a, a wonderful God. And one of the things that God does is he gives everybody gifts. And these gifts are very powerful gifts. They are things you can do. Some people have the gift to preach. Some people have the gift to build things with their hands to glorify God. Some people have the gift of speaking. But whatever your gift is, you need to use it to the glory of God. Now, one of the things that I know you guys have a gift of, because everybody's got it, is you have the gift of singing, don't you? You guys like to sing, I'll bet, don't you? Oh, well, I thought we might share with the congregation a little of you guys' gift today. I bet you guys all know Jesus loves me, don't you? Yeah. Would you like to sing that with me here? We can all sing along and then we can just talk about it. All right, let's, let's just sing a little of Jesus loves me, shall we? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus me. Good job. You guys just shared your gift with the congregation. Let's say a quick prayer, real quickly. Father, we thank you again for the wonderful gift of our children. We thank you that they have gifts that they can share with all of us. And we ask that you continue to bless them and bless us with your gifts in your name. Amen. Now, guys, I have a little gift for you guys. It's, it's not from God. It's from Walmart. But I thought I might share something with you. And as you're doing this, now take these back to your seats. And we're going to, whoops, have you take one each. Just go ahead and take one each. And see if you might be able to share that with somebody in your family. Share your gift a little bit. Okay? There you go. There you go. We want to make sure everybody gets one. Everybody get a gift? There you go. Come here. You need to get a gift. There you go. Thank you. Did you take a gift? Thank you, sir. We're going to invite Peter Buller to come forward to uh, share with us his gift of playing piano, making music a piano, and we invite God's spirit to flow through what he has to offer today.
However many years a man may live, let him enjoy them all. But let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. Everything is, is to come is meaningless. Be happy, young man, while you are young, and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see. But know that for all these things, God will bring you to judgment. So then, banish anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles of your body, for youth and vigor are meaningless. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming, the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. Holy God, we have heard you speak already. Open even more our ears to hear and our minds to think, to be stretched, and our soul and body to act and to accept. Open my mouth now to speak. Amen. So, you all are not only celebrating Labor Day this weekend, but you just totally partied it up because on the 1st of September, I started my third year here at Bueller Mennonite Church. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah. And it's like we like to say in our household, as soon as we're, as soon as we're uh, finished with our moving back from Bolivia, we'll, we'll start on with our life <laughs> uh, two years later. But one of the things I realized as I was reflecting over that, I have never preached a sermon on stewardship. Oh, you guys are like, oh, yes, we can't wait now. It looks like he's really going to give it to us. You bet I'm going to give it to you, not only this Sunday, but next Sunday. So we're going to have two Sundays of stewardship just to make up for it in case uh, my review comes back that I need to preach more on stewardship. <laughs> we're going to make up some time here. Well, all kidding aside, I think we have an important topic, and we'll get into it a little bit, uh, about what exactly is stewardship. So when we celebrate Christian stewardship, as we are celebrating today, and churches will throughout this month, we are celebrating our role as stewards of God's great creation. And we heard Psalm 24, everything is God's. It's a role, not that we choose, it is a role that has been assigned to humanity. So if we choose to do something else, that is a choice to not accept the mission we were given. So we are given from the get-go in Genesis the role, the task to have dominion over. Now a lot of us have interpreted that as meaning now we are rulers, we can do whatever we want with it. But in fact, if you look at the Hebrew understanding, as we'll get into it a little bit more, dominion means to serve as a mediator between us and God, to serve as stewards of caretakers of what is God's. Now, what is stewardship? Because really, it's not a word that you use often. I don't think you use often out in the world, do you? I mean, how many times do you use stewardship in your conversation with business or paying your bills? Maybe you did, I don't know. Or uh, at school. It's not really, it's, it's sort of a churchy word. Stewardship. So, so what does it mean to, be a, to, to have stewardship? Well, it means to be a steward. Again, not a word that we go around and say, yes, I am a steward. It's sort of a highfalutin churchy word. But the definition of a steward is a person who manages another person's property, finances, or other affairs. Now think about that. That is your God-given mission as a people. You are stewards. I am a steward. So stewardship, which is the act of being a steward, means then doing that, managing another person's property, finances, or affairs. So what we are celebrating today and what we are celebrating next Sunday is our calling as a church to manage the affairs of God as he assigned to us. 
to, man to manage God's money, to manage God's property, to manage God's affairs as assigned to us. Now again, as we found out from Psalm 1, everything is the Lord's. All material creation is God's. Now think about that. And we prodded it a little bit with questions because it's easy for us to sit here this morning and sing all those songs about, about for the beauty of the earth and, and praise the Lord, sing hallelujah. But then do you really believe the money you have earned that you are going to celebrate on Labor Day that you have worked so hard for is God's? Or the energy that was given to you to work is God's? Or your children are God's. They belong to God. They aren't God's. Or everything you have is God's. And hopefully you start seeing a subtle shift in what it means then to live your life. So today we celebrate our role as managers of God's creation. But one of our failures as human beings, one of our sins as human beings, is the failure of being good stewards. See, really, all of us are stewards. I don't think any of us reject being stewards. All of us are managing what God gave us, whether we accept the fact that it's God's. I mean, the reality is, it is. But the key comes with the modifier or with the adjective. The calling is not just to be stewards this morning. The calling is to be good stewards, faithful stewards. So in light of that this morning, I want to begin our two Sunday kickoff with this idea of stewardship, but from a different angle. See, most of you are going right now. I can, I can hear it. So when's he going to tell us we need to put more in the offering plate? I mean, how many times when stewardship comes up, it's tied to money, especially in the church? It's true. It has a lot to do with money because that's the thing we probably hold on to the most. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today, next Sunday. I'm going to talk about stewardship of aging. Oh, why is he talking about old people? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I got an amen. <laughs> well, one of the realities is because all of us are given and allotted time. All of us are in this boat together. You may think you're not. You may think you're 20 years old and six foot tall and bulletproof, but you're not. All of us have allotted time. And all of us are given the charge by God to make the best of it. If you are 16 years old, this sermon is relevant to you. If you are 40, young and 40 like I am, this servant, sermon is rel uh, relative. It is relevant. If you are 90 and older, this sermon is relevant. You are all given the gift of time. You are given the gift of your life. You are called to be stewards of that. So really, the today's question and our focus on aging, and I don't even want us to think in terms of how old we are. I'm thinking of the process of time. Really, the question that we are getting at is, how do we grow old faithfully? How do we use our time faithfully? Well, as we start thinking about that, I want to do a little bias test this morning. I'm not going to ask you to, to uh, give me any answers out loud. I want you to sit in your own place, and we're going to do a, just a little test of your own mind as we, before we move on. So I'm going to give you some questions, and in the silence, I want you to think about what that question evokes. Here we go. What are your feelings about aging? Especially when you heard me say I was going to talk about aging.
within that question, what do you look forward to? What do you fear about aging? What are negative role models of aging in your life? What are positive role models of aging in your life? How do you imagine yourself as an elder? Keep your answers lightly in the palm of your hand as we go on. Now, you heard Sarah read those two Bible passages. may not have seemed like the most uplifting, but they were written from a point of wisdom and an idea of what it means to age faithfully. Ecclesiastes 11 and Psalm 92. And these two provide a great foundation for defining faithful and creative aging, of defining what is this process, in whose hands is it? What can I do about it, if anything? Now, why might we need a good foundation? You see, I believe we are deeply influenced by an American cultural understanding of aging and use of our time that is more often than not negative. And I'm guessing that, and I, 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 I don't know this, but I can, I can have pretty good odds that when I said the word aging, the first thing that came up was negative within you. But that's not so in other cultures. And it isn't necessarily so in the Bible. So what is it about us that automatically when you heard me say aging or you even looked at the bulletin insert and you said aging? Why did I show up this morning? What's going on there? See, we are told that age is a negative thing. In fact, we spend tons of money. Our market is driven on trying to reverse aging. Think about it. All of us do that at some point, thinking that we can somehow stop that process. Furthermore, our economy dictates that people are only worth something as long as they are productive. As long as you can do what you were called to do, you are worth something. And when you retire and you can't do it anymore, you're worthless and you're going to spend your time in some home, fancy home, hopefully, where they at least feed you until you die. That's our mentality. I am done when my job is done. I am done when I can't do what I used to do for 30 years or 40 or 50 or 60. Where do we get that idea? Put the bull into greener pastures. Put it out to pasture. If it isn't productive, it isn't worth something. And it's interesting what our definitions of productive production and worth are. But the biblical view of aging is different. How did we get so far from it? The biblical view supports the opposite of our culture, to hide it. Hide it. Hide our age. Hide the fact we're not worth anything anymore. Hide the fact we can't do what we used to do anymore. Hide the fact that our hair is even turning gray. And mine isn't. This is naturally gray. The biblical view supports the opposite. Instead of worth decreasing with age, self-worth increases with age. The same thing was in Bolivia and other cultures we've lived in. Age is respected. When someone of age enters the room, with it enters wisdom and experience, and deference is given to it. As you get older, you get wiser, according to the Bible, and with wisdom comes the ability to begin to understand how to live 
a greater and righteous and faithful life. That in fact you become more productive as you age. Biblical self-worth is not dictated by how much you contribute to the economy, but how faithful or unfaithfully you use your time as a blessing, as you use it to serve God. Biblical self-worth is dictated by the attitude with which you use to serve and to live out the time that God has given you. Biblical self-worth is measured by the type of steward and time, of time and aging you are with your personal life. And elders that use this wisdom come, that comes with age are revered, are esteemed by the scriptures, by those around them, and by God. Now, if we accept, you know, we do a lot of talking in our culture. This is fun. We talk a lot about how the Bible is central to our lives. But if we accept the biblical view of time and aging versus our American culture of aging, then our thinking about aging and time will take on a shift. It will be different. Because when we begin to embrace the process of aging as something we can make the best of instead of trying to fight and run away from, and we see it as a gift of wisdom and experience and we revere those around us, things will change. How we speak about aging changes. How we fear changes. How we use our money changes. Whom we trust within this process changes. How we fully live out our gifts changes. And my challenge to you this morning is that you will begin to work at adopting a biblical view and outlook of age and aging and start letting go of our negative impulses of what it means to get old, to be a person of productivity, to be a person who is living out their gifts. Maybe, just maybe, you will be given a new approach to life. And to help with this challenge, I want to end quickly today by giving you seven steps of creative aging. And you can use your inserts because you will not remember them on your own. That's a process of aging. But the beauty is we gather together and have each other. Now these steps can be put to use no matter if you are, whatever, wherever you are at life, you can begin to use these as soon as you leave today. And they don't cost anything. All right, I'm going to go through them quickly. The first is wake up, is to wake up. Recognize your own mortality. You will die. The commercials won't tell you that. Our sensibilities won't tell you. We even plan funerals to make it look like no one has died. But you will. It is part of living is death. It is part of our salvation that we don't fear it. The reality is we all move from birth to death. All of us do. And the more we can face that faithfully, the more we can live fully. And part of that process is aging. So recognize that now, right now, is the time to engage in meaning and in direction in your life. Don't wait for something. Don't dwell on something. Right now, the time you are given is the moment. Do not leave things for tomorrow. Do them while you can. Each minute, each hour, each day, each year is a gift to be used as a steward. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. I love the verse. There was a point in my life where, where I was in, in, in some turmoil and it was actually the Roman poet Horace who brought it into perspective to me and I share it with you. He says, and he uses patriarchal language, but hear it, happy the man and happy he alone, he who can today call his own, he who secure within can say, tomorrow do thy worst for I have lived today. Wake up. Today is the gift you are given. Secondly, 
embrace sorrow. Acknowledge. And again, this is not something we are good as a culture, and not as something we are good in a Stoic society. Embrace your sorrows, your losses, your griefs. Talk about them. Talk about the pain in your life with each other. Listen to others who are sharing with you. Don't just do the manly thing and swallow it down because it's going to get you. Embrace it. It is life. And by embracing sorrow, you become more of a human being. You will deepen your humanity, your sense of being alive. And hopefully, it will turn us into more compassionate people. Again, this is countercultural. Because in our culture, we want only surface talk. We want only the good. We want only the whitewash. We want only the things that make us smile and laugh. But that's not reality. Embrace reality. Don't ignore it. Become fully human. And that's different than being a pessimist. I'm I'm inviting you to be realists within the time given. Because joy will come really if we are really honest about life. So embrace your sorrow and share it and and share with other people and listen to them. Second, name and savor your blessings. And we've all learned this since Sunday school and we sang, count your many blessings, count them one by one, and then we were forced to say what our blessings were (laughs) or else. But really, do it. It's a for good rem- a good good reason. Remember and celebrate the ways you are blessed. You are all blessed. You are. You are being blessed right now. You have been blessed. Be creative in recognizing your blessings because even when you think there is nothing of blessing in your life, you are being blessed. Be creative. Look for those things. Celebrate it. Name it. When you see something beautiful, a butterfly, name it. Celebrate it. The person might, beside you might think you're silly, but hey, he's not living in the moment. The story goes that a man whispered, God, speak to me. And a meadowlark sang, but the man didn't hear. So the man yelled, God, speak to me. And the thunder rolled across the sky, but the man didn't listen. The man looked around and said, God, let me see you. And a star shone brightly in the sky, but the man didn't see it. The man shouted, God, show me a miracle. And a life was born, but the man didn't notice. So the man cried out in despair, Touch me, God, and let me know that you are here. Whereupon God reached down and he touched the man. And the man brushed the butterfly off and walked away. Don't miss out on a blessing because it wasn't packaged the way you wanted it. Name, see, cultivate the ability to be a good steward with the blessings you are given. Five, well, we're behind. Five, reimagine your work. Review and revise the ways in which you want to contribute to society. Do not make your job your worth. Don't view retirement as a way of stopping your life work. Boldly live out your purpose. Do volunteer work, underwrite creative projects, mentor young people. Don't let culture tell you that your work is finished when you are washed up, when you are old. Live out your purpose every day of your life. Six or five, nurture intimacy. Deepen your relationships. And this is what all of us need to work on. Deepen your relationships with your spouse, your spouse, your siblings, your children, your grandchildren, family members, friends, nature, people around you, and most importantly, God. It does not happen by itself. You need to do it. Recognize that these relationships are more important to life than any amount of money that you will make. Any amount of 
cars or boats or anything you accumulate, any amount of land you accumulate, your relationships are the most important blessing that God is calling you to be a faithful steward for. You are never too old to work on your relationships. So nurture your intimacy within your family relationships. And now is the time, today is the time to suck up your pride and to go make right with people in your family that you feel anger towards. Now is the time to do it, not later. And that leads to the second one, seek forgiveness in life. Seek forgiveness, that means give it and find it. Do what you can to clear the decks of your relationships so that you can enter the later years with as much unburdened guilt as possible. Take time to repair your life. Release yourself from vindictiveness, from anger, from jealousy, from hatred. They only steal from you. Seek forgiveness. And the sad thing is that most people do not come to grips. In my experience, most people do not come to grips with the conflict and the wounded relationships in their life until they are on their deathbed, if they have that chance. Just imagine how much better life would be if pride and self-interest had been swallowed for the sake of relationship. Do not wait to the last minute, the last chance to make right with others. Seek forgiveness. And then finally, finally take on the mystery. Accept, as we began with, accept life and death. Don't run from it. Conquer it boldly. Live within it boldly. Explore the ultimate meaning of your life with thanksgiving and hope. Ponder the question, where do I fit in? What is God calling me to do with this moment today? And then prepare for a serene death and a glorious afterlife. This will provide you the solitude. This will provide you the courage. This will provide you the hope. Sure, we don't want to die, but it will provide you the power to make every single moment work. For you to boldly say, tomorrow do your worst, for I have lived today. Take on the mystery and allow God's hope and eternal salvation to drive you forward. Aging is a stewardship issue. How will you use the time and the life and the relationships that God has given you right now? May you use your gifts well, and may you use them wisely. Amen.
If you are willing and able, stand and we will sing the doxology as, a, as our gifts, our monetary gifts, are brought into the presence of God. Praise God from So how would you give testimony to how God is alive and well at work in your lives, the meaning of your moments, your days and your hours and the minutes? Where is it you would ask God to be more deeply involved through healing and peace for others and yourself? What guests would you introduce? What announcements do you make? Raise your hand, introduce yourself, and we'll pray. I already and and let's sing this song, The Work is Thine, O Christ Our Lord, as our Labor Day song. And as a, maybe a stamp of understanding what we are stewardships of, what it means to have meaningful work, what does it mean to put ourselves in the presence of Christ. The work is thine, O Christ our Lord, the cause for which we stand. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, brothers and sisters, be steadfast, be immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.